Well, uh, thank you all very much. Um, first of all, <clears throat> I'd like to express my gratitude to Professor Dr. Hans Hermann Hoppe and his gracious wife for the invitation. But I'd also like to say thank you very much to Jay Bacall for, for putting up with my constant vacillation, if that's not a contradiction in terms. Okay, he's been very indulgent to me as I repeatedly changed my mind sufficiently enough to drive any normal man crazy. So very much thank you to him for, for undertaking the practical organization of my trip. Um, I, it's very good to see some old friends here, and I think I've made some new ones, though whether you'll still be my friends after my talk, of course, is another matter. Uh, we should see. Um, so uh, the last two days have been a wonderful experience, and uh, I, I think most people's, most speakers' experiences, as you watch the previous speakers give their talk, is, oh my God, how am I going to follow that, right? So uh, the, the competition has been fairly high, and uh, I want to say that provided you don't expect the polished or urbane delivery of a Sean Cab uh, or a Nancy Daniels or the erudition of a Paul Gottfried or the wry wit of a Carlos Guevara or the logical passion of Leon Liu, perhaps you may not be disappointed. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is not the advertised program. Uh, one of my vacillations is to not to give the talk that I promised to give. This, this is the one I promised to give last year, but I didn't come last year, okay? So what I want to talk about today is, going, is entitled The Limits of Liberty or Hurrah for Repression. So <laughs> when discussing libertarianism, uh, I have found from experience that many people are willing to accept that such things as utilities and product creation and distribution and schooling and so on are capable of being provided by the free market. They don't do it without a fight, but they will eventually come around and concede. But they tend to draw the line at the provision of law, justice, and security. This, for many, is a step too far. And there can be no doubt, for example, that practically speaking, minarchism is a much easier sell than anarchism. It's incoherent, but it's a much easier sell. Uh, however, despite the fact that the law, justice, and security uh, objection is the logical and obvious point of resistance, the rhetorical or emotional point of resistance lies elsewhere, and this came as a real surprise to me. I'm a logician by training. I don't have emotions, right? At least as my wife tells me, okay? But, uh, <laughs> so I, I was really surprised by this. So while I thought that the problem was here, the problem was actually, I beg your pardon, I'm hitting microphones, was over here, right? And the emotional objection is, what will become of the poor? Your world, they say, you're a hard-hearted, heartless swine, or something even ruder, right? You don't care about any of these things. You care nothing for the plight of others. What I am asked will become of the poor. And of course, there is an answer to this question from a libertarian point of view, and I'm going to give it in a talk at Queen's University, Belfast, which I have entitled, perhaps somewhat provocatively, as Let the Poor Starve. Okay, maybe a little bit, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, because, in a sense, that is what people think that libertarianism somehow entails. And I'm going to address that question head on then. I'm not going to do it today, don't worry, okay? Um, but recently, I have had a slightly worrying experience, and I suspect that many of you here might have had something similar, which is that I have found people saying to me, I'm no longer a libertarian. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. Social order is breaking down. Philistinism is rife. We are presented with ever more vulgarity in public places, and I'm sick of it, and this is what libertarian leads to. I'm not a libertarian. Libertarianism, apparently, is not enough. To which my response is, whoever said it was. Where's the argument here? There's, there, the ships are passing in the night on this one. It cannot be too heavily emphasized that libertarianism is not intended to deny the importance of love, community, discipline, order, learning, or any of the many other values that are essential to human flourishing. Libertarians, as much as anyone else, can cherish these values, but however much they might cherish them, they reject any and all attempts to produce and maintain them by force, coercion, or intimidation. As T. Mackin puts it, force is permissible only in repelling force, not in building character, love, faith, scientific knowledge, and so on. And in the end, as Murray Rothbard notes, the question for the libertarian is this, and I quote, he says, should virtuous action, however we define it, be compelled, or should it be left up to the free 
and voluntary choice of the individual. I know what my answer to that is. And there is no third road. Okay, one must choose compulsion, however mild, but one must choose compulsion, or one must choose liberty. Now, even among libertarians, who might be expected to know better, misunderstandings can arise from a failure to recognize the severely limited scope of libertarianism. It is not intended to be, nor is it a complete ethical or political system. It is rather an overarching constraint on any such system. Libertarianism does not imply that all modes of conduct are equally valuable or have equal merit. There may well be those who think of themselves as libertarians who believe this, but such a view, despite the opinions of such as Russell Kerr, who, uh, who think that liberty descends into a maelstrom of license and does so necessarily, um, this is not a necessary consequence of libertarianism as such. A libertarian may choose to be a libertine, but there is nothing in libertarianism to constrain him to be one. Mackin asks again, is, liber is libertinism implicit in the advocacy of liberty as the highest political principle? And he answers, no. Libertarianism only prohibits the forcible squelching of indecent conduct, not its vigorous criticism, opposition, boycott, or denunciation in peaceful ways. So here's the question that must be put to determine if you are a libertarian. It's very simple. Would you be willing to use force that is physical violence, either yourself or delegated to another person or institution, to compel another adult person, children in a special case, to act or to refrain from acting in matters not covered by the non-aggression principle? If your answer is yes, you are not a libertarian. If your answer is no, you are a libertarian, and that is all there is to that. There is nothing more. However, we can happily concede that libertarianism isn't enough for an adequate moral, social, or political life, any more than water is the only thing you should drink if you like an interesting and varied diet. There is much more to life than to liberty. After all, the point of being free is so that we can go and do things, not just sit around gazing and admiring our liberty. Right? That's the whole point. So at this point, I need to make some distinctions that I think might help. I, philosophers do this all the time. Well, somebody once said about Thomas Aquinas that he never met a distinction he didn't like. Okay? So, so <laughs> I'm going to make some distinctions that I think might help. I want to distinguish between implication and entailment. I beg your pardon, implication or entailment on the one hand and consistency on the other. And I want to distinguish between cultural and political forms of conservatism and liberalism. Okay, and I think if we make these distinctions, it might help to clarify what's going on here. So considering the consider the following two propositions. University uh, College Dublin, where I have the honor to work, but only for another year. I retire in June, thanks be to God, right? Um, UCD is situated approximately three and a half miles south of Dublin city center. And the proposition, San Marino is a small city state completely surrounded by Italy. The two propositions are consistent. That is to say, they can both be true together. However, the two propositions are truth independent. The truth of one implies nothing whatsoever about the truth of the other. One can be true and the other false. One can be false and the other true. They can both be true, they can both be false. Okay? No connection, no implication, pure consistency. Now, libertarianism, okay, so libertarianism and political conservatism are inconsistent. They cannot coexist. You cannot be both at the same time. You cannot be a political conservative and a libertarian. Political liberalism and libertarianism are also inconsistent. Now, political conservatives, by the way, are not necessarily opposed to freedom. They're not just demons or devils, okay? Freedom is valuable, uh, but given the conservative commitment to order, it must be subordinated to morality and to traditional social norms. Libertarians, by definition, value individual liberty in a special way. They reject the imposition by force of particular conceptions of virtue, justice, and the good society, which, whatever value they may have, okay, does not justify the forcible invasion of another's freedom. Libertarianism concerns itself only with determining the conditions in which force or the threat of force may legitimately be used in human relations, namely for the protection of human individual liberty uh, all other employments of force or the threat of force are illegitimate. 
So too, you cannot, as I said, be a political liberal and a libertarian. Political liberals value freedom too, but they value other things more highly. And they are willing to coerce others to bring those values into being. But both cultural conservatism and cultural liberal liberalism are consistent, although not entailed by libertarianism. That's very important. They are consistent, they may coexist with it, they are not implied by it. And so is every other cultural position in between. One's cultural choices are not predetermined by one's libertarianism. What cultural position one chooses to adopt is an extra libertarian matter. Now, man is an inherently social being, living in and through society. Society is not simply a random assemblage of individuals, but is a network of individual relationships existing under a description, permeated and interpenetrated by institutions of various kinds, which institutions constrain, compete, and cooperate with each other, contextualize, and shape people's lives, and act as repositories of artistic, technical, social, and political knowledge. That's reality. That's the world in which we live. Society is not the outcome of some grand design or some overall plan. It is rather the evolutionary resultant of how people have lived their lives over many years. The decisions they have made individually and together, the laws that have emerged to regulate their lives in community and the means they have devised to further their rents. I should say, by the way, that in the context of previous uh, presentations, the questions of whether society is real or not, uh, again, it's, it's, the answer is, like many philosophical questions, it depends on what you mean. Um, society is not real in the sense in which a garden gnome is real. If you go for a walk late at night in the dark, you will not trip over society, right? You cannot have a chunk of society. You cannot buy it in the market. But that does not mean it is not real. I think most of us as libertarians would believe that the market is real. But the market, too, is not something you can trip over late at night. The market, the market is a nexus of interpersonal relations, and it is a shorthand way of talking about it. So society, too, it is real, it is a nexus of these interpersonal relationships. It has a second level mode of reality. It's not fundamental, but it is real. Okay. Now, society at bottom then depends upon attachments that precede reason and calculation, such as love of one's family and locality, and other attachments that radiate outwards from there into one's country and one's nation. Such attachments are constitutive of one's being, and they are not chosen arbitrarily. You do not choose where you are born. You do not choose the language you speak as a native language. Now, in their focus on tradition, conservatives are onto something important, which, however, may not have the political implications they think it has. It is true, it's undeniable, that much, as I said, of what we are is simply given to us. It is not a matter of choice. The family we belong to, the nation we conceive of ours, the language we speak, the way we speak it. Indeed, many of our ideas, all of these are important, perhaps uh, constitutive parts of what we are, parts of our identity, if you like. Okay, yet not matters of choice. Okay, I'm always reminded of uh, the uh, song in HMS Pinafore. In spite, uh, okay, in spite of all temptation to belong to other nations, he remains an Englishman. Okay, he might have been a Prussian. Turk or whatever it is he goes on to say, right? When, of course, the reason that's funny is you don't have that choice, okay? And even if you change your nationality, even if you take out citizenship in another country, it can never not have been that your original, your place of origin was where it was. You always, in a sense, remain something of where you come from. So one chooses one friends, but one family is simply a given. It makes sense to talk of an ex-friend or an ex-roommate or an ex-partner, but we would struggle to make sense of someone's referring to his ex-father or his ex-sister. However, fractured your family relations might be. Okay, in matters of nationality, then, in matters of family, we are in what Henry Maine would call the realm of status, not contract. Hmm. Yet, despite being constitutive of our identities, tradition for the libertarian has at best an heuristic rather than a normative function. For however much something has been done, for however long, and for, by however many, questions can always be asked. Is this right? Is this good? Is this the best? And these questions subvert any ultimate normative claim that tradition can make. Now, while some libertarians adopt a hostile attitude towards custom, habit, and tradition, and in particular towards religious traditions, this was not the position of the preeminent libertarian of the latter half of the 20th century, Murray Rothbard. 
In an essay on Frank Meyer, who sought to fuse the conservative love of, uh, of custom reverence for tradition with the libertarian's love of liberty, Rothbard wrote that custom, quote, must be voluntarily upheld and not enforced by coercion, and that people would be well advised, though not forced, to begin with a presumption in favor of custom. A key point of tension between conservatives and libertarians is precisely this question of coercion. But if it were granted that one should not be coerced into observing custom or traditions, Rothbard, for one, was more than happy to go along with much of conservative thought. In a late essay already mentioned by Marco Bassani this morning, coincidentally, um, he, he wrote that individuals are bound to each other, sorry, I beg your pardon, he said, libertarians often mistakenly assume that individuals are bound to each other only by the nexus of market exchange forgetting that everyone is necessarily born into a family and one or several overlapping communities, usually including an ethnic group with specific values, cultures, religious beliefs, and traditions. And you can either think that Rothbard was losing it towards the end of his life or that he's actually serious about this, and I incline to the latter view. Now, libertarianism differentiates itself from liberalism in both its classic and modern uh, uh, incarnations, and also for conservatives interjecting the use of force in all cases except that of resisting or punishing aggression. The modern liberal is, or was until recently at least, content to use the power of the state to enforce his economic views on all to produce what he considers to be the correct distribution of goods and services, while claiming as large a space as possible for personal, especially sexual, uh, morality. I lived during the, the free love era, but it passed me by completely. God, I, I want to go back, okay, and do it all over again. This time, one of you know, anyway, it's another story. Um, the conservative, on the other hand, generally wishes to leave as much room as possible for economic activities while recruiting the state to enforce his moral views on others. Libertarian just says, freedom across the board. Now, when it comes right down to it then, the difference between conservative and libertarian is not whether order is desirable, it is what kind of order and where that order is to come from. For the libertarian, genuine order arises intrinsically from the free interaction among individuals and among groups of individuals. It does not descend exogenously from above. It is clear then that conservatives and libertarians accord liberty different priorities. Nisbet claims that for libertarians, individual freedom in almost every conceivable domain is the highest of all social values, he says, and is so irrespective of what forms and levels of moral, aesthetic, and spiritual debasement may prove to be the unintended consequence of such freedom. Whoops, if that's true, we're all in serious trouble. This is an instructive but fundamentally mistaken judgment. On the contrary, I should say that for libertarians, liberty is the lowest of social values. Lowest in the sense of most fundamental. A sine qua non of a human action's being susceptible of moral evaluation of any kind or in any way at all. Human freedom can be used for all sorts of actions, directed to all sorts of purposes, which are then susceptible of moral evaluation. But unless human action is free from coercion, moral evaluation is intrinsically impossible. I don't know about you, but if, if a dog were to bite me, it would be considered perhaps inappropriate, although I'm cherry about saying this because people believe really bizarre things. It would be very strange to go to the dog and say, you really shouldn't have bit me, okay? That's not the kind of thing you should do. Okay, my guess is if you do that sort of thing, you're going to be taken off by men in white coats in a van, right, to a, an institution. Whereas if a human being were to bite you, it would be perfectly appropriate, having got over your hostility, to say, what the hell do you think you were doing, right? It's entirely different. Because we regard human beings as free in a significant sense, and dogs not. Anyway. So libertarians value freedom as a hard core without which nothing morally, which, without which morally significant human action is not possible. But to repeat, while libertarianism as such has nothing to say beyond asserting and defending individual liberty, this is not at all the same thing as thinking that libertarians in living out their lives are concerned with nothing other than liberty. I was making a joke this morning at breakfast. I was saying that uh, in, in my country where the Irish language is dying, that, that one of the jokes uh, in, the, in the Irish language community is the only thing you can talk about in the Irish language is the decline of the Irish language. Okay, so it's a bit like the only thing you can talk about in libertarian circles is liberty, as if somehow this is the be all and the end all and nothing else matters. But in your life, it, lots of other things matter. But liberty is a sine qua non. It is fundamentally important, basically important, but it's not the only important thing. Um, as if to contradict, uh, contradict Nisbet, Murray Rothbard, whose credentials as a libertarian I don't think anyone can deny, remarked that only an imbecile could hold that freedom 
is the highest or indeed the only principle or end of life. For him, such a claim is scarcely coherent. He agreed with Lord Acton that freedom is the highest political end, not the highest end of man per se. And I think that says it all. Now, a libertarian then can accept to a large extent the presumptive legitimacy of existing social structures, but without conceding any inviolable status to them. And a libertarian can be a gradualist in respect of necessary or desirable change, albeit a rapid gradualist, okay, as fast as possible. Such is the complexity of existing institutions, however, however objectionable those institutions might be, but such is the complexity and their intertwining with our lives that any immediate radical change is likely to be wildly destructive and perhaps even inimical to a coherent and approved restructuring. Fiat justiti, I ruit celum, okay? Let justice be done, though the heaven may fall, is an easy thing to say, provided you're not like Samson inside the temple when you push the pillars, okay? I'd rather be outside the temple. I don't want the roof to collapse on me when I'm inside. All right, let me just then talk about how this links up, okay? How I think libertarianism is consistent with, I think, cultural conservatism, and why I think cultural conservatism is, other things being considered, arguably the better position to take. And I say arguably because I don't think it's a knockdown drag out argument. Uh, in, o in order to improve their situations, human beings act. And in order to act, there must be something about one's current situation that has, is apprehended as being capable of improvement. So you're sitting down for a long time, you're tired of sitting down, you want to stretch your legs, you stand up. Tired of standing up, you know, it's too long, you sit down. Okay, there has to be some felt dissatisfaction for you to remedy. The reason you act is to change your situation. This is not an empirical discovery, this is conceptual necessity. <laughs> and we try to bring that about when we act. Uh, There's an old joke again, sorry about the jokes. A man came across a, a friend of his banging his head against the wall and said, why are you doing that? He says, because it feels so good when I stop. Right? Well, yeah, okay. Um, now, a being perfectly satisfied in every way would not act. Indeed, it's a moot point, indeed, if he could act. And this is, a, this is a perennial problem in philosophical theology. Just as in economics, equilibrium is tended towards but never reached because of the ever-changing kaleidoscopic nature of the world in which we live, so too in our human lives, complete satisfaction is never attained, but is at best intended. Our ever-changing physiological conditions, for example, force us to act to preserve homeostasis. And we are also psychologically unstable. Uh, and if St. Augustine is to be believed, we're, we're spiritually unstable. He wrote, after all, famously, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts know no rest until they rest in thee. Okay. So, we have a choice. We can live hand to mouth, as our ancestors did, or we can try in a more ordered and long-term way to improve our situations. The way we do this economically is by the creation of capital. Point this point, of course, should be obvious, but it isn't, apparently, because you have to keep saying it. Uh, there are many bad ideas in the world, um, th which, despite their demonstrable and demonstrated idiocy, refuse to go away. Vampire notions that simply won't stay in their graves. One such idea is Marxism in all its variety of forms. And characteristic of Marxism and Marxists is their complete inability to appreciate the nature and function of capital. This may sort of seem surprising given that Marx wrote a very large and boring volume on this topic, okay, and two others added later, but when you read through it, if you ever do, and it's penance, well, there are some exciting parts of it, but it's mostly incredibly boring, you realize, I don't know what this man is talking about, and I don't know if he does either, right? Um, Marx and his latter-day disciples are prey to the ever-popular illusion that consumption is the key to an economic prosperity. Here's the basic idea. When you state it as boldly as this, it is really idiotic. The way for everybody to get rich is to spend like crazy. What? How is that supposed to work? <laughs> okay. okay, I don't know how that works, right? Uh, and of course, uh, capitalists, by exploiting their workers and by hoarding their ill-gotten gains, are guilty not only of theft, but of bringing the whole economy to ruin periodically. Now, the basic fallacy here is a variety of the postdoc ergo proctor hoc, or maybe come hoc ergo proctor hoc, namely because after this, therefore because of this, or with this, therefore because of this. And so, see, decreased spending is associated with the bust phase of a boom-bust cycle, so our Marx has come to think that the bust is caused by the decreased spending. So we need stimulation, right? We need to get people spending more. We need to get money into the pockets of the workers so they can go out and spend. Well, the very last thing that's required in an economic bust is exogenous stimulation of the economy. Okay, the economic hair of the dog solution is just as ineffective in economics as it is in drinking and simply postpones or prolongs the inevitable hangover. 
or recovery. You wake up in the morning, you've got a hangover, you take a drink, you feel better. Yeah, but, but yeah, you're just postponing the hangover. You can spend now, or you can save later, or you can save now and spend later. What you can't do is spend now and spend later. <laughs> okay? It would be wonderful if we lived in a world in which you could do this, but you can't. Of course, the inconvenient truth is that capital is the very first requirement of genuine economic development, but capital can be acquired, and here's where I come to the, second, the subtitle of my talk, Hurrah for Repression. Capital can only be acquired by a restriction on consumption, by a deferral of immediate gratification. Saving is the key to prosperity, not just for the bloated capitalists, but for all. Now, the Marxist misunderstanding hasn't gone away. The unlikely publishing sensation of this year was the massive volume, of course, that we've heard about already of Thomas Piketty, entitled Capital in the 21st Century, which, as the title suggests, presents itself as a kind of das Kapital, brought up to date. As an account of capital and capitalism, it is just as spectacularly unsuccessful as Marx's original uh, with a, uh, work, with economic aggregates such as national income and return to capital dancing with each other in a kind of bloodless ballet. Right? Uh, Piketty, conflating real wealth with monetary instruments, is animated throughout by an egalitarian envy of those who have more money than others, and not surprisingly, perhaps, he earns the praise of those like governments who have a vested interest in relieving the rich of what the governments regard as their ill-gotten gains. Perhaps the book's, the book's most egregious error is the idea that capital is a kind of economic cornucopia which, whose gifts never fail, sort of like magic beans in Jack and the Beanstalk. Right? but which automatically, even mechanically, produces ever-growing wealth for its owners. Profit, profit, profit is all that capital can ever bring. Never, it seems, a loss. Well, of course, this is true of government-sponsored capitalism, crony capitalism. It is not true of real capitalism. I mean, capitalism, you can lose your money. Right? Not in crony capitalism. But capital plays a role in culture as well. And it is no more miraculously produced in one area than in the other. Both require saving, restriction, limitation, delayed gratification. All of this perhaps initially induced by our family and our society, but later self-imposed. So a civilized existence requires both freedom and order, just as a sound economy requires capital, which is produced by saving, by delayed gratification, so too cultural capital is similarly produced by delayed gratification. Freedom without order is like a sudden release of energy, pointless and destruction, like an explosion. <laughs> okay. If you want energy to work, you've got to channel it. And restriction is the means of channeling. And the whole of culture is a largely, is a system of devised systems of restriction for producing this. Now, I'm gonna make this claim, and, and, and I've never done this before, and this is where I may lose all my friends, if I have any. Okay. Cultural conservatism is, I believe, the Austrianism of culture. Right? Cultural liberalism is the Keynesianism of culture. One says, save before you spend. The other one says, spend, and if you have to, save. <laughs> right? That's the difference. Very important. Now, I'm going to uh, finish by uh, quoting, uh, uh, by basically purloining the thought of a fellow countryman of mine. In the words of Edmund Burke, Burke thought that manners mattered more than law, and even more than morals. Was he crazy? What did he mean by this? Well, he thought that both law and morals depended largely upon manners. In his little read, but very important, letter on a regicide peace, he said, quote, manners are of more importance than laws. Upon them, in a great measure, the laws depend. The law touches us but here and there, and now and then. Manners are what vex and soothe, corrupt or purify, exalt or debase, barbarize or refine us by a constant, steady, uniform, insensible operation like that of the air we breathe in. They give their whole form and color to our lives. According to their quality, they aid morals, they supply them, or they totally destroy them. Now, I've taken issue with Burke in other areas, and I, I don't agree with everything, but this I find particularly uh, insightful. We do not produce and maintain our manners primarily by some process of detached reason. They arise naturally in the context of social relations. Such judgment as they embody is a kind of pre-reflective judgment, what Burke calls prejudice. Manners as prejudices allow us to act swiftly and surely and rightly without the need for agonized reflection and reasoning. 
And at the root of manners is the notion of restraint, of limitation, of delayed gratification. And its product is a kind of social capital. You can have ordered liberty, says Burke, or you can have license. Which will it be? Now, libertarianism is compatible with both Burkean liberty and Burkean license. And a libertarian can arrive at substantially the same conclusion as Burke with this difference, and it's an important difference, that the restraints and limitations that channel or exercise of liberty must, with the exception of the restraint of actions aggressing against others, be self-imposed, self-accepted, and not imposed by the coercive power of the law. When manners decline as a result of cultural decay, then the law, or rather legislation, rushes in to fill the vacuum. Matters that, in a culturally rich society, are dealt with by informal sanctions now have to be overtly regulated by laws. For example, date rape or hate speech, with a consequent intrusion on our liberty. OK, can I digress for a moment here? When I was growing up, um, not that long ago, well, maybe longer than I like to think, right? Um, it was considered highly improper to take, as it were, as the expression was, to take advantage of a woman who was incapable of making decisions because she had more drink taken than she probably should have, right? And any man who did this was severely informally sanctioned, not just by women in the community, but by his fellow men. Severely sanctioned, right? So your, your ability to do this in the first place was severely inhibited by the notion that if you, were do, if you did something like this, you would incur really heavy social disapproval. Well, this is no longer the case. And when, of course, those restraints disappear, the order has to be imposed in some other way, and so you get date rape laws, and then no one knows what the hell. And now, I mean, if you're thinking of having sex with any woman, you should probably get a form and sign and say, I, the following, agree to have sex with you between the following hours and such and such a day, and so on, unless, of course, I internally revoke this consent, in which case we will sue you for rape in the morning and get 14 years. Right? It's crazy. Okay? Now, but the law is a crude and a blunt instrument, uh, and regulation is both ineffective and stifling. I'm almost finished. So here's the finish. Man does not live by legislation alone. If society is replete with minute and detailed legislation, such a society is a society whose, whose social capital is rapidly declining. And I suggest that that is a description of much of Western society as we experience it today. The question is whether such societies can recover or not. And that's a matter of conjecture. Some societies have done so in the past. We can see ups and downs if you look at the past. And others have not. And societies that have not have collapsed and disintegrated. In any event, order is needed for human flourishing. And you can have it by minute and intrusive legislation, or you can have it by what Burke calls manners. The choice is yours. I know what my choice would be. Thank you very much.